Então a terceira e última conferência de hoje tem como título Energizers and Hindrances in the Design and Implementation of Mathematics Curricula e está a cargo do professor Arzarello e teremos como moderadora Manuel Encarnação. Muito obrigada, boa tarde a todos. Eu talvez seja a pessoa mais outsider desta sala, sou professora de música, mas foi com muito bom grado que aceitei o desafio da Direção-Geral para vir moderar e conhecer o professor Ferdinando Azzarello. A, a, a música e a matemática são, de facto, linguagens universais, a, com muitos pontos em comum, mas também muito diferentes. A, e, nesse sentido, eu sinto-me à vontade, não tenho trauma com a matemática, sinto-me à vontade para poder a, a estar aqui. Uh, professor uh, Fer, uh, Ferdinando Azarello é professor titular de Educação Matemática do, no Departamento de Matemática da Universidade do Turim, do qual também foi presidente. Presidiu também a Escola de Especializzazione al Enseñamento Secundário, de 1999 a 2003, bem como ao mestrado em Educação Matemática na Universidade de Turim, e é atualmente o responsável científico por dois Massive Open Online Courses para professores de matemática oferecidos pelo seu departamento. É autor de cerca de 150 publicações científicas sobre temas de educação matemática, as bases da matemática e lógica matemática, principalmente em revistas internacionais e monografias. O ensino da matemática constituiu a parte central do seu trabalho de investigação, em particular o ensino de álgebra, geometria e análise, o currículo da matemática, o estudo dos processos de ensino e de aprendizagem matemática, com particular interesse nos quadros semióticos. Participou em vários programas de formação de professores e desenvolvimento curricular para o Ministério Italiano da Educação e da União Matemática Italiana. Foi orador convidado em várias conferências internacionais em todo o mundo, tendo participado em vários projetos internacionais de investigação relativos à educação matemática. Foi presidente da Comissão Italiana para o Ensino da Matemática, de 98 a 2006, membro do Comitê Internacional de Psicologia da Educação Matemática, de 2004 a 2009, presidente da Sociedade Europeia de Investigação e Educação Matemática, de 2009 a 2013, presidente da Comissão Internacional de Educação Matemática, de 2013 a 2016, atualmente é membro ex officio da Comissão Internacional de Educação Matemática e da Academia das Ciências de Turim. É ainda coordenador de um grupo de investigação educacional em Turim, do qual fazem parte professores universitários, alunos de pós-graduação e docentes do, uh, dos ensinos básico e secundário. Vou então dar a palavra ao professor Ferdinando Azarello, cujo título da conferência nos motiva imediatamente para as questões da construção e implementação curricular, nos seus, queremos saber, os seus energizantes e obstáculos na concepção e implementação do currículo da matemática. Graças. professor. Thank you so much, Manuela. As you said, uh, music and mathematics have a common thread from Pythagoras to uh, Fourier to the modern sound synthesizers. So it's a common way we have done together. Of course, each one with its competence. First thing I have to put is that uh, uh, while Mathematics is universal, not so for its learning. Learning of mathematics is deeply rooted in the cultural environment where it happens. Imagine that I, not, I made this speech, not here looking at Hieronymus, but in Rome looking at Colosseus, or in uh, Oxford looking at some college or in Shanghai, looking at the monuments of Shanghai. So it's, it's apparent that also from the very uh, so superficial things, but very important things, that things are different. So a consequence of this is that I cannot suggest you things uh, because I am not acquainted with your culture. I know something, but I don't know really. So I remain from the outside and I'll try to tell you something which I think could be useful, but it's on you to 
take the opportunity of revising, of uh, uh, designing, or whatever you wish to do with your mathematics curriculum. Of course, you take have, uh, information from the other experiences, but it's your own concern, particularly not basing, as far as I can see, on foreign inputs, which are not criticized, are not critically investigated. That's the sense of what I'm going to tell you today. So, and uh, so I'm speaking of energizers and hindrances because of this. And uh, energizers and hindrances, uh, to, to, we have to, there are some obstacles between what, what, what we are going to do and such, a, but the interesting thing and the funny thing is that uh, sometimes there is some ambiguity because of the cultural roots. Something that in a context and according to some point of view can be an energizer, help to overcome the obstacle, in particular situation can be an hindrance and vice versa. So what I am saying must be carefully investigated, analyzed from you, because what I think is an energizer maybe is hindrance in your context. So that's important for me not to, 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 to give you the idea to come from somewhere and to tell you what you have to do. I learned as president of ICMI that uh, there are a lot of approaches to curricula, depending of the situation of the nations, of the culture, of the political situation. Of course, there is another aspect which has been stressed today, particularly by Kuno uh, uh, presentation, namely the issue of globalization. So there are these two things which are uh, possibly contrasting each other. So I start, so here is an overview which I'm going to, what I'm going to tell you and namely some uh, small comments about this uh, 21st century society, which is a challenge for curriculum, as we have heard already. And then some smaller uh, framework for multidimensional framework for curriculum, and uh, some energizers, and uh, some hindrances. And then I'll give you, I'm afraid, only one example from what I call Paideia 2.0. Paideia is a work, is a Greek word. I'll tell you what it means. And uh, I think that's important to reflect upon this Paideia. So, 21st century society. It's a complex challenge for curricula. The distinguished researcher, sociologist, philosopher, Sigmund Bauman, who died a few days ago, by the way, spoke of liquid times. Liquid times are defined by him in many books, but uh, they, uh, they feature our, the, the way society is changing, has changed and is changing, constantly changing conditions, uncertain future, collapse of long-term thinking, focus on short-term goals, focus on individual responsibility, risk to, is to stand still. So it's something which, is, uh, the, which uh, creates a break with the, the, the society where I was born, and may, maybe also some of you have, born, have been born. So what uh, is uh, the main feature of this new society is that while, in my point of view, when I was uh, a student, when and I have also this with me now, because you have with you all what you told, have been taught, you have some connection between present, past, and look at future. But now this thing have, in a sense, been destructed. So the, 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 there is some uh, not so clear distinction. And, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, what, uh, uh, using the Bauman language, you have a pointless time, only point by point, not connection. No is culture, the solution of the plot that connects the present with the past and with the future. Someone today in the round table spoke of the need of narratives and the hypothesis to understand mathematics. 
That is missing today. So the Norwich culture, dissolution of the plot, lack of narratives. These are words by uh, mm. Baumann himself. And so I think that this puts forward uh, some challenge for the education in general, and particularly then for mathematics education. And uh, a consequence of this is that uh, a lot of information in the website, you find everything and the opposite of everything. So, oh, zero information in the end. So you have to give students and young people and also older ones a key to, or some keys to being able to read such sort of things. Otherwise, the main goal of teaching is lost. So, yes. So here is the word of paideia. It's from Greek culture. It means something like, uh, uh, we could say, ed education of the, for the citizenship. It was the education for people living in the polis, paideia. But it's a paideia 2.0 because it might take into consideration the, this uh, liquid time. And so we can speak of liquid practices. So a challenge for us is to uh, uh, design educational projects, programs, which are against the pointless time aspects in order to reconstruct narratives, to give a sense, uh, mm, a distinguished mathematics education scholar, Alan Schoenfeld, speaks of the sense of mathematics. And that's the main issue in the classroom, to give the students the sense of what mathematics is, and the enthusiasm, et cetera, something has been said already. Reconstructing narrative, reconstructing intersubjective links, using, of course, the ICT affordances for surfing through this uh, uh, liquid society, but uh, with uh, uh, a consciousness of what one is doing, not in a, so to say, blind way going in the sea and let's go where the sea goes. And so to reconstruct this. So uh, some people speak of liquid practices. You, some, you find some of them. This, these are from an Australian research about this. Uh, in a university, they are doing something in this sense. I skipped the, the, the list, but you can imagine something has been already said. But here, it's a delicate issue. Because that ambiguity between what is an energizer and what is an hindrance can enter the scene. And so it's important to evaluate and to assess such sort of things. So that's about the general framework. And now to a specific, let me go to a specific framework for curricula and uh, uh, multidimensional. There are many dimensions in a curriculum. From the one side, you can look at uh, very micro examples. For example, uh, um, the, the last examples of uh, uh, Kino, the, the Kino, is it? Kuno, sorry. Uh, this morning, where of this uh, aspect, micro. But there are also macro aspects. Many things that have been said today by Kuno, by uh, Tony, by in the round table concern macro, some other concern mi micro. But there is another dimension of curricula, the facets. So we have the intended curriculum that is written. Oh, wonderful. Students have to do this, have to do that. Oh, da, da, bam. But there, is also, there are also textbooks. Someone mentioned them. In Italy, for example, textbooks, uh, I mean, I think also elsewhere, of course, are determining how a curriculum is developed. They change every day. In Italy, I, said, I told someone this morning that Italy is a crazy place. They change laws, everything, every year, over two years. And so it's a, OK, like a dance and so curriculum changes. And the book changes, but they don't change. It's always the same book. They change in some sense the surface. So the curriculum remains the same. Then there is the implemented curriculum in the classroom by the teacher. 
So here enters the teachers. Then there is the assess curriculum. What I am saying to, today, there has been some discussion about this. What I am assessing corresponds to what has been acquired in the school. And uh, what is learned in the end, which is a mystery in the end, because it's very difficult to, to, to get this. So these are the facets of curricula. But of course, there is a third dimension, the topics. I am speaking of these things in geometry, in uh, uh, calculus, in arithmetic. Some of them, have, many of them have been mentioned already. And uh, so these dimensions could be, are important and could be all considered by designers of curriculum in order to design, in order to compare, in order to focus on some problems. So generally, one thinks only to the intended curriculum and say, oh, you have to do this, this, this. It's only a part of the story. And it's not the real story which happens in the classrooms. So some small uh, contribution uh, it's a complex task, designing curricula. So you have to take into consideration all these dimensions and, uh, and uh, take into consideration the issue of uh, liquid times, liquid practices, and the, the need for reconstructing narratives, etc. It's important that in a curriculum you take, you consider two aspects, at least, of mathematics. So to say, the instrumental and the cultural function of mathematics. It is an essential instrument for a quantitative understanding of reality. And logically, and uh, from the other side, logically coherent systematic knowledge characterized by a strong cultural unity. That are the two faces which must be there. If you have only one of them, you miss something which can be very important. But uh, oh, it's written here, something. But the teacher, the teacher is supposed to tackle these themes in an integrated manner, trying to connect them to other topics and to other subject disciplines, as it has been said. But it's a difficult task, not so easy a task. And uh, uh, so what uh, we need in a curriculum is not only the intended curriculum, good textbooks, blah, 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 blah. We need examples very, a lot of examples, in order that you communicate to the teachers what is the sense of the intended curriculum they have to develop in the school. And without examples, everyone could say, oh, I am already doing that, so I will not change. That will happen, so in the, uh, in the mean, at least. Uh, Second consideration, particularly for policymakers, the risk of ambiguity in comparing curricula. We have heard something in the previous comments. Uh, so if one takes into consideration this structural complexity of a curriculum, uh, one is aware, can become aware of uh, the difficulties in comparing. The complexity of the structure shows how complex an analysis could, should be and how easy can be drawing superficial or wrong conclusions because of some level or facet is forgotten. As Silver, mathematical education researcher in USA, as Silver points out, the intention and actions of the consumers of international comparisons often rests on too simplistic assumption about the relationship among the various interactive constituent parts of the educational system in a country. Official curriculum goals, textbook used in the school, teaching practices, teaching preparation, and ongoing support and student learning outcomes. It's a complex, a variety of things to take into consideration in possibly an objective way, as, as far as it is possible. But a superficial approach can have negative consequences. For example, policymakers 
to being used to undertake programs and give recommendations which rest on partial or, or misinterpreted data. That's an important issue for them to consider. So let me go to energizers. With the proviso, I said at the beginning that energizers sometimes become hindrances. And I show some examples. So you have a curriculum is like this. You see there some compartmentalization. When you have you've categorized, you subdivide, and possibly you create comparts, separated from each other. But it's not the right way to consider. We have to connect them. Otherwise, you have only one aspect. And so how to is, does it connect with another one? And uh, so that's uh, the wall we can find and the obstacle we can find, namely to go towards the right parts of the facets and not remaining to the left part where you have the, the uh, intended curriculum only. And uh, it's important to consider that a, a tool for breaking such obstacles is influencing, acting on teachers' beliefs, not only on teachers' knowledge, teachers' belief. And that uh, is proved by uh, research. I'll show, tell you something. The, the main issue is that without the contribution of teachers to the elaboration, not to the application only, there is no change in the implemented curriculum. Let me say something more specific about this. Uh, so here, um, the, the, the influence, I read only the last sentence. The, list, the influence of teachers' belief with, on this gap between the intended and implemented curriculum uh, is remarkable. There are researchers on this. And many studies, studies basing on PISA teams, etc., show that notwithstanding the emphasis given in many curricula to high-level cognitive processes, reasoning, problem solving, they have been mentioned today, the beliefs of teachers about the effective ways they can teach mathematics to mean achievers, not to the best ones or to the worst ones, to the mean achievers, are at the origin of the limited opportunities they give to their students in such processes in their lessons. So they say, oh, I agree that we have to uh, push problem solving, uh, inquiring, scientific inquiry, etc. But the mean square student doesn't understand that. So I have to explain it in a very specific uh, and uh, systematic uh, way. And uh, these beliefs persist in the schools Notwithstanding, many researchers show that the better learning occurs exactly in those classrooms where teaching is based on high-level cognitive demands and not only on stressing procedural instruction. But that beliefs are very strong, and that's uh, some. Here are some you will find in the uh, in the uh, slides uh, that uh, many researchers about this, such an issue. And the other energizer to connect the different components. Let's start with technology, which has been mentioned. So someone today has mentioned exactly this NCTM principles, the standards, uh, technological principle, and uh, I think Leonora mentioned exactly this list. And it's important. You look here at the data. I put an arrow for Portugal. You have the difference between students who are not using ICT in the mean and the students who are using ICT, the square versus the, the triangle. You see there is a difference, in, a remarkable difference in the performances. Here is the PISA uh, result. I don't remember which year. Maybe the last one. So it's important to consider the issue of going towards the digital school. But this possible energizer can become an hindrance, as I'll tell you, in not immediately, but after a while, basing, 
basing on uh, some comments from PISA studies. I come to that in a moment. Assessment. Oh, assessment is a typical ambiguous thing because from the one side, cons, uh, con, con, it's, uh, there is an education test oriented. So the teachers uh, teach their students only to answer the test, whatever it means. So it's a very terrible things. There is an old study by uh, some um, uh, person in Al Cuoco in, in uh, USA about this, which was terrible. Of course, there are possible, also pros, there are possible positive effects on school practices. Teachers look, oh, look at this. And uh, it had uh, some of this kind happened in Italy. In Italy, you know, Italy is a, a part of a crazy place. It's uh, splitted in different uh, uh, situations. We have Northeast, uh, which is comparable with uh, Finland. Or, uh, and we have a Southern of Italy, which is comparable with Mexico. So a very, uh, so I'm not uh, uh, telling uh, nothing about Mexico. I'm speaking of Italy, of course. But here you, you look uh, and uh, on the bot top bottom, you have the uh, effect of some interventions in this kind uh, of assessment of making uh, uh, meetings with teachers in the southern part of Italy. And we have had a considerable uh, increase in, uh, I'll tell something later about this also if I have the time. So it's a typical ambiguous thing. And moreover, the most important thing is the teacher's educational program with the collaboration of all instances. Here is what happened in Italy. So I don't pretend that this can happen in or must happen in Portugal. I don't know, as I said, and I only tell you what happened in Italy that I know I was responsible for some, most of these things here. So with the Italian Mathematical Union, we had a commission, a big commission, which at the beginning of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the century or of the millennium, if you wish, we uh, started working. It was a commission made by mathematicians, math educators, teachers, all on the plane of equal responsibility, and they created, a, a proposed a curriculum. It was uh, uh, funded. Uh, by the Ministry of Education in collaboration with ICMAI. There were also uh, the Statistical Society, not only the Italian Mathematical Union, but SIS, Statistical Italian Society. And we elaborated the curriculum and 200 examples of activities in the school from grade one to grade 13, which is the last grade in higher secondary school in Italy. Then it, this uh, proposal uh, was improved in another project uh, from 2006 to 2015, MATABEL. It's an acronym with the name of ABEL, of course, and where we had the interactive online activities with teachers and also a blended uh, uh, system in face-to-face -face meetings and uh, online uh, meetings for improving the implemented curriculum. And then in 2012, the Ministry of Education took the opportunity of having this curriculum to create the intended curriculum inspired by this. And now they are going towards the digital school. So that was happening. That's some influence and some, the result in the South uh, happened also, we think, because of this and not, uh, uh, there was a lot of funding because we had, we had the, mentors and tutors who met the teachers uh, systematically in the classroom and explained the philosophy of this new curriculum. Here are the books, Mathematica per il cittadino, Mathematics for the Citizen, Paideia, 2.0, because there is also internet. And here is, a, you can download it, it's in English, so you can find it, and uh, it's some uh, summary, it's a booklet of uh, 80 pages, or 100 pages where you have a summary of the, of the work. And uh, so let me go to hindrances. How, lo how long a time have I How many times? Oh, yes, a lot of times. 
Thank you. So, hindrances for learning. I told you technology is an energizer, but it's a typical, also can be a typical uh, mm, hindrance. Why? This is explained by this report, 2012, of PISA about technology. And uh, here is the, 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 the slide I showed you before, where it's shown that, OK, using technology helps in the performances of students. But, but, look here. Here is the, so look at the, the left mathematics and the right reading. So the two main issues of PISA. Uh, so uh, the, the red line indicates the percentage of use of ICT and uh, the blue or whatever color it is, uh, black indicates the performance of uh, students. You see in the high top quarter, there is a difference. So the, the, the use of uh, ICT goes down in a sense. So that's uh, an intriguing aspect of what is, what is happening. The same thing happens in for reading. So the, here it's taken from the report of PISA. PISA shows that even when most students have easy access to new media, inequalities persist in the way they use these tools. The use of online media depends on the student's own level of skills, motivation, support from family, friends, teachers, which vary across socioeconomical groups. So it's some kind of, let me say, a cat with his uh, 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 beating his uh, uh, tail, so something like that. And uh, ensuring, that is taken from PISA report, ensuring that every child attains a baseline level of proficiency in reading will do more to create equal opportunities in a digital world than will expanding our society access to high tech devices and services. So surfing in a blind way in the liquid situation is very easy. But if it's not, you've not uh, get uh, s enough skills to orient it, how to surf, maybe useless. Playing games, oh, games are wonderful. A lot of things are done with games in mathematics. The, the, the strategy, strategic thinking. Today, they, someone spoke of strategic thinking. No, oh, it's there, using games. But uh, if you use games like so, I think it's not so much a strategy. Maybe it is, but you have to make it apparent who, to people who are using them. So another thing that has not yet been mentioned, and I wish to mention here, an hindrance variable in mathematics curriculum development, the gender gap in mathematics. <coughs> That's an important issue. And uh, I invite you, this is an invitation, I dare to invite you to think of this. We are thinking to this in Italy, and uh, uh, in Europe, uh, in US, they are thinking. In Europe, not so much. In Italy, not at all. I don't know in Portugal. Boys keep doing better than girls in math test. According to PISA, the average gender differential within OECD countries in mathematics of, uh, at the age of uh, 15 is 0 0.11 standard deviation in favor of males. So boys perform better. I'm not saying they are better. They perform better in PISA tests. Here is the data. Uh, I underline in red the data for Portugal. So you have girls on the left and boys on the right. So you see 536 against 547 and some uh, average state uh, score, etc. So there is a difference. Uh, the, the, even worse in Italy. And the same happens in many states of OECD countries. And uh, if you look at the differences between boys' and uh, girls' performances, 
in mathematics. Here I put in red the Portugal. You see the, the, the blue, this part here, is the average. This is the low achiever. And here are the high achievers. So high achievers, in, for high achievers, the difference between boys and girls is more than 20, 30, about almost 30. So it's something we have to think about because there are some consequences for this, economical consequences for jobs and for economy of the country. The presence of a substantial female's disadvantage in maths is of particular importance because it's likely to be a cause of the critically low share of women choosing STEM disciplines at university, of gender segregation in the labor market, and gender pay gaps. There are some documents of the European Commission in different years. The main funding from researchers in USA, they are the most advanced for this, about primary school, confirmed by PISA service at 15 years, is that the mad gender gaps starts as early as in kindergarten and increases with the age of the child. In Italy, for example, it dramatically increases at the, uh, a, at the grade, uh, from grade five, six, seven. It's uh, increasing, and then it increases more. But that's the, the point. And uh, so uh, I don't know the, 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 the specific uh, data for Portugal from this point of view. Maybe they are interesting. Yeah, I told already that uh, the gender gap is higher for, high, for top performing students. Initially, boys appear to do better than girls, than girls among well performers and worse at the bottom of the distribution. By third grade, the gender gap still larger at the top appears throughout the distribution. So it increases. But the starting point is not that uh, for genetic reasons or things like that, uh, girls are, uh, are worse than boys for performances in mathematics. Survey responses regarding self-concepts in mathematics, year five and six, and in the importance of math for their future life, year 10, show that boys are substantially more confident on their own abilities than girls are, and that they are more aware of the importance in math for their future. So in a sense, uh, the girls renounce to, to, to do mathematics because they at a certain age, they think they are not able to do that. They are not, oh, they I do some other things. So that's a pity. Reducing the gender gap in STEM education and decreasing the number of women graduating STEM subjects leads an increase in labor supply and employment. Gets, this could help reduce bottlenecks in the labor market. There are some uh, data for this. Here you look at the uh, uh, the GDP per capita uh, is a projection for two, 2030 and 2050. The blue, the dark blue, indicates the difference uh, if uh, girls had the same performance as, uh, as boys in, the, in such things of mathematics. There, is an, there should be an improvement of data, which in absolute value would be uh, substantial, and you see it uh, would increase. So that's important. How to face this? The one hypothesis, but that's uh, to you to, to, to decide, is to support laboratory uh, approach in mathematics. It seems that, uh, according to some researchers, this could uh, uh, increase the the, the, uh, the, f the, the fact that uh, uh, girls become more confident in mathematics. I leave this to your thoughts and to policymakers' thoughts also. It's an important, crucial, also economical issue to consider. And uh, now, let me come to Paideia. How long? Five minutes, okay. Uh, an example. So. Uh, before, uh, I, I propose you an example of uh, the thing, you remember, paideia is that thing that uh, 
uh, try to reconstruct the narrative, the, the, the links between past, present, and future to give students also, to give, uh, so to say, to introduce in the school some critical thinking. So it's not, it's important that uh, our uh, uh, students get jobs and get the good jobs when they uh, finish their schools. But it's also important that, uh, because uh, one of the main issues of this uh, new economy is that things change rapid rapidly. So one gets a job, then after one year he has to change the job to another one. And the uh, flexibility is important. But flexibility is gained also getting a, a knowledge on narratives, not only on specific things that uh, you are, do, are good to do in that case are not able to, to, to do in another case. So here is a proposal, and uh, I would like to make a comment before introducing it. Uh, it concerns uh, secondary school. But I was thinking to some comments today about my arithmetic and the fact that uh, you have to look uh, it's important, of course, arithmetic, men mental models, etc. But uh, no one, as far as I remember, mentioned an, uh, a very important issue. Someone mentioned the, 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 the fingers to count, but there is another thing that uh, are used, is used when counting. Language. Language creates something which is different from fingers and different from the representations in base 10. Uh, numbers. In Italian, I think also in Portuguese, we have different things. Other languages, even worse things, remember, think to France, French language, Catavan Disneuf, which means to say uh, uh, 99, they have to say four times four, 20 uh, plus uh, 19. Danish language is even worse because there are fractions inside. So, and that's what is the, the fact, is that students are exposed to different representations, including language, and they have to, 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 to surf among that, to get the skill to go from one representation to the other. But it's, this is really mathematics. Mathematics is not numbers. We don't mean numbers in the street. We have uh, tables in the street, in, in, the, in the room. We have... Uh, uh, cars, etc. So I say the word car and there is a car. There, it's passing. There you say the word table and here is a table. But to say the number three, where is number three? I can write this in this way. I can write, I can represent this in this way. I can see toi uh, or whatever. And so the issue of mathematics is uh, the interactions between different representations, not the interaction with the things. Sometimes uh, is a uh, Mm, not so clear that. So I wish to tell this, but now I come to, and this also is a Paideia 2.0 possibly, and here is the example, and uh, it's concerned the processes of change. Change is very important because the higher, our science, the revolution, modern revolution, starts with the analysis of Galileo of the inclined plane. 1604, the first scientific experiment made in the world. But today, we have different things where processes of change are important. You can have them in the, uh, in the iPhone. You can look at the growth of, of plants. You can uh, look at population growth. You can have a lot of data from the website, controlling them, etc. And so it's very important uh, thing. Uh, David Toll speaks of uh, cognitive roots of mathematical concepts. When something is a, a consonant, cognitive consonant, what uh, your uh, uh, being as a person in a certain culture, but there is, a, and this is very important, change is something like this. It's a cognitive roots. Every one of us draws attention to something which changes because of surviving problems, of surviving, probably for surviving uh, when we were uh, at the beginning of our history. But it's uh, epistemological relevant because it's the origin of the scientific revolution and the origin of calculus. 
and uh, it's culturally important. It uh, helps to understand change in climate economy. And so it's a crucial issue in 21st century economy, uh, society. But uh, didactically, there is a strange things in many Italian, also in other countries, book I checked, fine differences are not there. They are not the usual curriculum. It's, they are not there. But they are a powerful tool that can be easily implemented with didactical software. And it's understandable very easily, the difference. What is more evident than the difference? And allow modeling a variety of phenomena from early grades. We have not to, attend, to wait for the, the, I don't know which grade in, in, uh, in Portugal, in Italy, is the last two grades. It's at the end of 12 and the, in 13th grade that they teach differential calculus. So it's a pity. The most of science uh, cannot be explained with the, its own language. But uh, there is also a finer idea of language, which is in everyday language. Look at here. This difference of the surface of the two leaves is uh, in absolute value five square centimeters. But everyone understands that uh, the increase in the left is much more remarkable than that in the right. Why? Because we have, uh, one, in one case, we have 100%. In the other case, it's 10%. So it's a relative change. The relative change, which is a basic tool in economy, in biology, in everything, is not so present in our books. At least I'm speaking of Italy, don't know, in Portugal. And so that's a, a very simple. So you, you can, it can be increased. Uh, you can do a lot of things with such ideas, also from the mathematical point of view, using here is GeoGebra, but you can use a lot of different uh, uh, software, uh, looking uh, at uh, different environments, uh, the graphical environment, uh, the algebraic environment, the, the spreadsheet environment to connect them each other. So. Uh, um, this morning, uh, 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 Greg Mayer spoke of uh, the instrumental approach. Here is a typical instrumentation. Uh, uh, well, if you can use, you have, find such sort of things in iPhones, in uh, mobile, in computers, so everything is there. And here you have uh, some, uh, I am not the time to enter. So when you are looking at the, the relative differences, when you remain to polynomials, the relative differences are going down. There is nice in economical interpretation for this. You need exponential functions to have a constant and possibly an increase in relative uh, things. So that's uh, the Malthus law, which according to which you cannot uh, get the, 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 the uh, necessary food with the population increases uh, in an uh, uh, exponential way. And here is also instrumentation. But you can go on. The, so biology, economy, here is the model of Ferlasti. So it's a lot of things that you can do, starting from elementary school, where you are looking at the growth of plants and arriving to Ferrell's law about uh, 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 populations and economy and so on. So in that uh, uh, things, uh, I am finishing. Uh, in that... Uh, uh, website that uh, I indicated you with, with the booklet, you find some other example. So that's what I wish to tell you, considering hindrances, energizers, with this ambiguity and uh, the, we, in the environment of our liquid times. And uh, what I'm... Uh, uh, it's important. The moral of my talk is to break hindrances, to transform them into energizers. We need the critical attention to the ongoing changes in society and the careful actions on teachers' and students' beliefs, families also. Otherwise, also the best intended curriculum will produce little change in the implemented and learned ones. What is happening? Oh, sorry. Obrigado. com uh, a quantidade de energizantes e obstáculos que, que, que temos e a complexidade do processo curricular, uh, abre o debate. Uh, 
Uh, agora temos, uh, já estamos adiantados, 10 minutos. Well, quite interesting uh, overview. I would like uh, uh, one thing that called my attention was this reference. Can you repeat that? Yes, the reference, the reference of this book, no. math Mathematics for the Student, that you took an example from there, or did not miss Sorry, you? What can you Mathematics for the Student. Uh, you gave a reference of some book that you could, we can get from, oh. no, I misunderstood you. Yeah, there are some books in Italian, so with that sort ah. of thing. So All right. I okay. can send you, there is a book, a very nice book written in last year by a very good expert a teacher. I don't remember the title, but I can send what can you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, okay. Here. Uh, sorry, he asked, uh, uh, you understood the, the, the question. Yeah, yeah. and uh, my answer was that for students, as far as I know, in Italy, there is a nice book written by an expert my, uh, teacher uh, for secondary school, where you have some types of examples and other also of this kind. His, his name is Domingo, which is a name familiar with you, and Paola, which is uh, the family name, not uh, the, the, the Christian name. Domingo Paola. I don't remember the title, but I send you to uh, the, the, the organizer the, the title. It's in Italian, of course, but I think it's not so difficult to to read, and maybe there are other things. As far as I know, in Italy, there are not so many things like this. I want to ask uh, two questions. Uh, you stressed a lot the, um, the need to influence uh, teacher beliefs so that they would uh, do something uh, different from what was uh, previously done. Uh, you, you spoke about this uh, mathematics for the citizen curriculum. Certainly this was uh, not an easy curriculum to implement. How did you work on this uh, teacher belief uh, parts in order to uh, uh, push this new curriculum? And the second question is, in Italy uh, you have this uh, quinta class, uh, uh, so you have one extra uh, year of secondary school, the fifth year of secondary school. Um, do you think, in Portugal now, we have that uh, 12, uh, do you think uh, this extra year is a plus or a minus in the context of the education system in Italy? So I answer before to your second question, I think it's a minus. The Ministry of Education thought to eliminate it, but they, uh, th there were some technical problems. In, uh, if you eliminate the last year, in that year you have double number of students attending universities, and university cannot afford that. So <laughs> it's very simple. And so they decided not to do anything. But it's uh, too late for students to... to, to you, they uh, take their uh, abitur at the uh, age of 19, so it's too late. So that's... Uh, and the first question was, ah, yes, Oh, it was a very difficult task. In fact, the, because we published the book, we made some conferences, uh, and the books, of, uh, you saw the titles. So we decided to, uh, <coughs> to elaborate the second program that was the Matabel project. And uh, because of some funding for Europe, we got some money, particularly for the southern part of Italy, which is a depressed zone for from many points of view. And uh, with, the, the, with that, we elaborated this uh, blended. Uh, so we, uh, first, we uh, instructed uh, the authors of the, of the Mathematica per il Cittadino, Mathematics for the Citizen, uh, uh, instructed uh, uh, about 200 um, expert teachers to be tutors for, uh, for uh, making meetings with the school. So the school were at the, to organize in networks, small networks, and uh, at the, the, the each uh, um, tutor 
had uh, the responsibility of the of uh, the network. So they met online, and they uh, were uh, illustrated the, the the activities. And the meanwhile, the activities had been changed, adapted to the digital school and things like that. And they also had some face-to-face -face meeting, not so many, three meetings, one at the beginning of the course, one after a while, and one at the end. And the, in the meanwhile, they met on the website uh, uh, using a platform, etc. And they, they, the teachers uh, uh, used that uh, materials, or some of those materials in their classrooms. They discussed uh, them, they interacted with each other, telling which were the, the difficulties, they had to compile uh, some comments, etc. So that's uh, had some effect in the, particularly in the, the press zone of Italy, particularly in the southern of Italy. That was, uh, I don't think it's, uh, it worked in a marvelous way, but it worked in some way, and the PISA results, I think, they show that. Oh, by the way, the material for Matabel concerned only five years, and then, uh, namely, for from grade uh, six. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then we made also something for primary school, but the last years were uh, not there, so are not there. Thank you, Professor. Uh, e terminamos aqui. Não há mais nenhuma intervenção. Terminamos aqui. Agradecemos ao Professor Arzarello pela sua contribuição.